Good evening, hushlings, and welcome. I present your preceptors to the underbelly of the void, the whispers of conjecture, and the known of the unknown. Thus begins the conclave of the Hush Hush Society. Three witches danced on the heath last night, dancing widdishins round a tree. Wildly widdishins whirled the three under a wild and cloud-swept sky, while a goblin moon rode high over the hill where the old stones lie. And their hats were peaked, and they twittered and squeaked as they danced in the green moonlight. And out of the boughs of the twisted thorn came the wail of a violin, queer and evil and sad and thin. And though there was nobody one could see, somebody played in the twisted tree queer sad tunes for the witches three, till a lost wind crept from the hills and wept, and the farm cocks crowed up and Good day, Hushlings. Welcome back to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. Where we doth journey into the world of conspiratorial mysteries and dark truths. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And as always, we're joined by our cauldron master, Slick Frank Sanders. Hey, Slick Frank Sanders here. Brewing it up. (laughs) Stay whipping in the kitchen, bro. (laughs) Whipping in the kitchen. Welcome, Hushlings, to Hushtober. We're getting spooky all October long with all of our debriefings. We are so Ooh. glad to have you here. Throw on your Halloween masks. Check your Kit Kats for razor blades, kids. And make yourselves some roasted pumpkin seeds. Oh, my God. We're getting spooky. I ate some raw pumpkin last year. It was terrible. Do not recommend Little trick for you little hushlings out there. If you're carving up a pumpkin, don't cut a hole in the top. Cut a hole in the bottom. Then stick your dick in it and make a girlfriend (laughs) get all the pulp out. (laughs) October is where you really shine. Thank you. It's my month. It's my time. If you don't try that this October, then you're not really living. All right. (laughs) Hushlings, we pulled a little switcheroo on you. This week we were supposed to take a walk into Skinwalker Ranch, but instead we will be going through the Salem Witch Trials. But, fear not. Next debriefing, debriefing 34, will be Skinwalker Ranch. That'll be October 18th. For debriefing 33, we travel to Colonial New England and whisper about the tragic happenings of the Salem Witch Trials where 19 people were tried and executed under the suspicion of witchcraft. We explore what events led up to the trials, introduce some of the victims and their stories, as well as the aftermath of the unfortunate ordeal. But before we burn ourselves at the stake, make sure to follow us on all social medias. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to make your way over to the spooky official Hush Hush Society website, hushhushsociety.com. Where you can find all of our debriefings, our declassified discussions, cryptid chronicles, as well as blogs, news, and drop a review. And you didn't think that I would let you forget about the drippiest of drip on Mother Earth Hush Hush apparel. We have a ton of things on sale right now, and we have plenty of new, fresh designs on the way. And just a reminder, Hushlings, before we jump into this debriefing, November 1st, our official Patreon is going live. We are going to have so many little extras that all you Hushlings are going to love. Extra segments, extra debriefings, stuff that the normal public won't be able to see or hear. It's very secretive. We will send you a decoder ring in the mail. Coming November 1st, price points are super cheap, $3 and $5. So you're going to get a a great value. And I'm not talking about Walmart. Rollback prices. The Salem Witch Trials were a series of hearings and executions of people accused and prosecuted of witchcraft 
in colonial Massachusetts between February 1692 and May 1693. Over 200 people were accused across the Massachusetts Bay Colony. 30 were found guilty and 19 were executed by hanging, 14 of which were women and 5 men. One man by the name of Giles Corey was actually crushed to death for refusing to give a plea, and at least five people passed away while jailed. Another notable man was John Proctor. His wife was also executed. People were arrested in numerous towns beyond Salem and Salem Village. Today, that town is known as Danvers. The grand juries and trials for this capital crime were conducted by a court of Oyer and Terminer. Weird names. In 1692, and by a superior court of Judicator, both held in Salem. Witchcraft was held as a higher crime than murder. Well, yeah, you're consorting with the devil. Back in colonial times, yes. that's they'd rather have somebody going around and stabbing people or whatever than dancing in the forest with the devil. Yeah, it's better than that. Anything's better than a campfire. It was the deadliest witch hunt in the history of colonial North America. This episode is one of the most notorious cases of mass hysteria. It has been used in political rhetoric and popular literature as a vivid cautionary tale about the dangers of isolationism, religious extremism, false accusations, and lapses in due process. Mm. Did you guys learn? I mean, obviously, I think it's kind of the curriculum of all school kids, but did you learn extensively about the Salem Witch Trials when you guys were in school? We didn't learn extensively about it, but I want to say it was in in high school, maybe my junior or sophomore year, we had to read the Salem Witch Trials in an in English class. And that mostly focused on like John Proctor and his wife and their story. We didn't have like a whole unit on the trials themselves, but more so just the book. Wasn't that the Crucible? Mm, the Crucible, right? yeah. The film was, they made it so different. I think John Proctor was actually in his like 60s or 70s and this guy was in his like 20s or mm, 30s. Yeah. <laughs> when I was going to school, they made a really big deal out of it. So much so that we spent almost an entire quarter of the school year looking into the Salem Witch Trials and learning about it. And at the end of the quarter, they actually put on a play at the school about the Witch Trials. <laughs> it was a huge deal and I don't understand why. Maybe it was like our proximity to Massachusetts. Yeah, I think that was it, because I clearly remember us learning a lot about it. They do it around October because it was like... Spooky month? You know, <laughs> yeah, witch-related or whatever. All the worst parts of it happened in the in humid Mass Bay summer. I'd love to hear if some hushlings had that embedded in their curriculum if they live on like the West Coast or the Midwest or something, yeah. just to confirm whether it's proximity or if it's just like filler in curriculum or something. Because Salem is, is realistically a hop, skip, and a jump away from where we all grew yeah. up. So. About an yeah. hour and a half. Though this was unfortunately not unique, but the colonial American example of the much broader phenomenon and superstition of witch trials in the early modern period, which took place also in Europe during what was known as the Inquisition. Mm. I was reading that in Europe, I don't know the dates in between. I know it started around in the 12th century. There was like 50,000 people in Europe that got executed because of witchcraft. Holy. Jeez. Yeah, like estimated. That's probably documented. Mm. But the Inquisition started in 12th century France with the aim of combating religious deviation, apostasy, and heresy, or witchcraft. The Inquisition, also referred to as the Holy Inquisition, was a group of institutions within the organization from our boys, the Catholic Church. Studies of the records have found that the overwhelming majority of sentences consisted of penances, but the cases of repeat heretics were generally resulting in execution or a life sentence. Time to die for things that we don't understand. <laughs> I actually wonder how much of that, like you said, Frank, like things that we don't understand and what their criteria was for heresy, per se. Exactly. Were they just not abiding to like the Catholic religious law? This is God. This is it. If you're praising anything else, that might as well be heresy. There were many inquisitions throughout history. One of the most well-known was the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition is just one through this whole period of Inquisitions. But the Spanish Inquisition obviously killed a bunch of people for the same thing. They also went after other religious groups. 
people of the Jewish faith in that population got attacked even in those times. I think it was like the 1300s and the 1400s. Even the Mexican Inquisition, which is an extension of the Spanish Inquisition in North hmm. America. Those things, I don't think people realize it's that deep and it just keeps going until colonial America. I never knew there was a Mexican Inquisition. I was doing some research on the actual Holy Inquisition and it just was just, a ra- it wasn't a rabbit hole, but it was just the list went on and on of how many through from the 12th century to pretty much the 16th, 1700s. Wow. A lot of people died for witchcraft and other things. Yeah, very interesting history with the Catholic Church too. If you look back far enough with the Crusades and now the Inquisitions and stuff like that, for touting themselves as a peaceful religion, they sure took a lot of people out. Do you think if somebody from the church way back in the day of the Inquisition saw me put my pants on both legs at once, like just jump right into my pants, they would would burn me at the cross? Because, you know, I've been practicing this for years and I'm getting pretty good at it. Um, But if if a normal person saw you do that, do you think it'd be considered like heresy? No, it'd be a TikTok. Yeah, there you go. You know, there's like the saying like, oh, I'm a regular man. I put my pants on one leg at a time. To put them on two legs at a time would would impose that you're not a, a regular person. Think about it. Yeah, I don't know. That's but <laughs> witchcraft. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but in the how does stuff put their pants on with two legs? It actually started back in the Obama administration. <laughs> I was listening to Obama give a speech, and oh, I'm just a regular person. I put my pants on one leg at a time, and I took that very personally. I took it as a challenge, and I've been trying to put them on two, <laughs> two legs at a time ever since. I'm not kidding. See, Obama is blamed for everything. Thanks, Obama. Yeah, thanks, Obama. No, you got to remember, it's 1692. People, if you were like a teacher or a judge or anybody, a priest, I mean, anything like that, you believed witches were real. Belief is a very strong thing. Let's take a deeper look at the belief behind this heresy and witchcraft. There was a belief in the supernatural and specifically in the devil's practice of giving certain humans, mainly witches, the power to harm others in return for their loyalty. This idea had emerged in Europe as early as the 14th century and was widespread in colonial New England. There was also the harsh realities of life in the rural Puritan community of Salem Village at the time, including the after effects of a British war with France in the American colonies in 1689. There was a recent smallpox epidemic, fears of attacks from neighboring Native American tribes, and a long-withstanding rival with the more affluent community of Salem Town, which is present-day Salem today. Apparently there was a lot of land disputes too. These people just hated each other. It's kind of like modern New England. (laughs) Except they didn't have a dunks. (laughs) (laughs) You little dunkies. (laughs) Tension mounted and the Salem witch trials would be fueled by resident suspicions and resentment towards their neighbors, as well as their fear of outsiders. Yeah, dude, neighbors were really, really brutal to each other. Literally, it was life or death. That's the craziest thing about the situation. It's literally your neighbor right now being like, you know what? They did this. Pull you out of your house, shackle you up, and they're like, all right, you're dead. Yeah, it's like word is law. This is also setting the scene for a really paranoia-driven community already. They're already weary of each other, they're weary of outsiders, they're weary of anybody that's not their family, maybe even in some cases they're weary of their own family. It's kind of a recipe for disaster with what comes afterwards. This is what makes this entire thing crazy is, like you said, it's a small community, but it branches out from neighbors to then the next town, the town over there, the town there. In January of 1692, nine-year-old Elizabeth Betty Paris and 11-year-old Abigail Williams, who was the daughter and the niece of Samuel Paris and the minister of Salem Village, began having fits, including violent contortions and uncontrollable outbursts of screaming. After a local doctor named William Griggs, (laughs) Bill Griggs, Bill Griggs, Billy Griggs. Griggs, he diagnosed bewitchment. What a fucking diagnosis. <laughs> just comes in with a bunch of leeches and he's just like, she's a witch. <laughs> bunch of leeches. <laughs> I don't know. Just tapping Some stakes into their fucking nasal cavities. <laughs> Does it hurt? <laughs> she bleeds. Witch. Witch. 
What an asshole, Billy Griggs. <laughs> Bewitchment, not a cold? Really? <laughs> she could have had the shakes. Like <laughs> <laughs> She got the shakes. She can eat a fucking peanut butter sandwich. You're driving steaks into her nose. He came with judgment, not a Snickers. It's really shitty. You know, Abigail Williams, <laughs> when you get hungry, you become a witch. Here, have a Snickers. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were other young girls in the community that began to exhibit similar symptoms, including a girl named Ann Putnam Jr., Mercy Lewis, Elizabeth Hubbard, Mary Walcott, and Mary Warren. In late February, arrest warrants were issued for the Paris' indigenous Central America slave, Tituba, along with two other women, the unlucky Sarah Good and the poor elderly Sarah Osborne, whom the girls accused of bewitching them. The three accused witches were brought before their magistrates, Jonathan Corwin and John Hathorne, and questioned. Even as their accusers appeared in the courtroom in a grand display of spasms, contortions, screaming, and writhing. I read a lot about this whole thing. It's crazy when you look at this story that there is, I would consider it non-visual evidence. While these girls are screaming in pain in these courtrooms, sitting in these pews, and they're like, oh my god, she's hurting me. She's, she, she, the devil inside her is hurting me. And the person being prosecuted can't say anything about it. That's enough evidence to charge them. Maybe they had temporal lobe epilepsy. Ah, see? Good and Osborne denied their guilt. Tichiba confessed. Likely seeking to save herself from certain conviction by acting as an informer, she claimed that there were other witches acting alongside her in service of the devil against the Puritans. As the hysteria spread through the community and beyond into the rest of Massachusetts, a number of others were accused, including Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse, both regarded as upstanding members of church and community, and the four-year-old daughter of Sarah Good. Ah, uh, see, that's messed up when you're accusing a four-year-old of being a witch. I don't know if you've ever been around a four-year-old. That's an ugly child. <laughs> witch. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been around a four-year-old, but they, they do a lot of weird and rambunctious stuff. So, yeah. Uh, that's rough. Why is it crawling like that? <laughs> like Tituba, several accused witches confessed and named still others. Man, no loyalty between these yeah, chicks. For real. And the trials soon began to overwhelm the local justice system. In May of 1692, the newly appointed governor of Massachusetts, William Phipps, ordered the establishment of a special court of oyer to hear or terminer to decide, as Mike mentioned before, on witchcraft for cases in Suffolk, Essex, and Middlesex counties. The judges, including Hathorne, Samuel Sewell, and William Stodden, the court handed down its first conviction against Bridget Bishop on June 2nd. She was hanged eight days later on what would become known as Gallows Hill in Salem Town. Damn. Can you imagine? These people are like, well, we're going to order people to just start naming everybody that's a witch in these counties. It's a good way for you not to be charged with anything because I guess at this point, they're like it says... They're becoming informers. They're snitching on other people. So that's more valuable than going to hang one of these people. I can't help but wonder how many people died just because somebody that didn't like them, like, threw them under the bus. A lot, dude. Like, this person was nasty to me on one yep. occasion, so I'm going to say that they're a witch. Well, in this ordeal, no 19 people for a small village. That's a considerable amount it's like of like half the population. And only, like, three of them were <laughs> witches. <laughs> five more people were hanged that july five in august and eight more in september in addition seven other accused witches died in jail while the elderly giles Corey, martha's husband was pressed to death by stones after he refused to enter a plea at his arraignment reverend burroughs and john proctor were executed on august 19th 1692 dude being pressed to death is not something that I would enjoy. No. <laughs> you just feel the blood creeping up through your lungs and shit. Yeah. And like your bones breaking. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even think about Well, that. during a little bit of the research, they found documents and stuff. There's, See, this is kind of a conspiracy theory. It's almost like a cover-up here. There's a lot of things we don't know about the Salem Witch Trials and why this happened in this pocket. 
and why people reacted the way they did. Because there was plenty of witch hunts, I'm sure, through colonial America. And they just kind of were like, oh, it's one here and there. But this kind of was neighbor on neighbor. It was mass hysteria at the highest level. It's weird to me to even kind of fathom how people were thinking. People were already hating each other then. Land disputes, this and that. So it's like, well, fuck that person. Go hang them. But this was happening like kids. I think the thing that's crazy is that this whole community was already ravaged by one, you have the war, the smallpox, all this other stuff going on. And New England weather is brutal. Imagine living in colonial New England with that same weather. It's the new land or the new world. Yeah, you're on the fringes of what you don't know. And there's also a native population that wants, there's some of them that want to kill you. It's a Mm. pretty hostile place to be. Except on Thanksgiving. Yeah. Except on Thanksgiving. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. We all broke bread on Thanksgiving. Imagine just sitting there watching somebody getting pressed to death. In my research of looking into one this and then a little bit diving down that hole of the Inquisition. I mean, the Inquisition, they either burned people, they hung people, or they crushed them. And then you have here where there's journals that have been found from some of the people that were not really about it. They were just community members that were just kind of observing because they're like, this is fucked up. We're probably going to have to write about this. Mm. I think it was John Proctor's son. They tied him from ankle to, to neck and kept pulling and pulling until blood rushed out of his nose and his ears. Oh my God. Like savage shit. There was like torture and there was a lot of stuff that happened Salem Witch Trials Mm. that must have been fucking horrific to live through that. But at the opposite end of it, you also have this weird obsession with violence or people getting what they deserve. So you have this mob mentality within Salem where these people are actually enjoying it. So they're watching people get crushed and they're watching people get burned at the stake and they're actually kind of enjoying it because, again, it, you know, humans are fucking weird. Well, and, and their and their <clears throat> twisted mind, they might be under the influence that they're making the world a better place by getting rid of these people. True. Because they were so entranced that everybody accused is a witch and that they should eradicate them. Not that that's right yeah. or anything, but... I think it's this. It's like the spectacle. It's like, you know, Rome and the Colosseum. People gather to watch crazy shit happen. It's also the spectacle. Probably imagine being like an 11, 12-year-old girl and you have all this attention on you because you're the one being possessed and you're the one calling the shots. You got to remember, yeah. what's her name? Paris. That, that Her father was kind of a psychopath. I did some research on him, too, on some of these individual people. And not only was he the pastor of the village, but a lot of the people that were accused went to church every Sunday. Yeah, And it's just pretty wild that it wasn't just neighbors. It was literally family members that were, they said this. And you're like, holy shit. That probably only helped push the paranoia further because Mm -hmm. it wasn't a situation where they could look at Mrs. Smith and go, oh, Mrs. Smith is a wonderful old lady. She goes to church every day. She prays and reads the Bible. So now it's looking like a situation where anybody could have been affected by being a witch or by being tempted by the devil. That paranoia only had to grow because there was nobody that was safe at that point. No, you could be rich, poor. You could be a man or a woman. It didn't matter. Warlocks, man. Hushlings, we will return after these brief messages. Greetings, Hushlings. Declassified Dave here. Join us for an all-new Declassified Discussions. This week, we invite Georgina Rose, who is a blogger, occultist, ceremonial practitioner, writer, and Thalamite, and is the host of Magnolias and Magic Podcast and Dot Darling YouTube. With your preceptors, Mystery Mike, myself, and Slick Frank Sanders, airing on Monday, October 11th from WTHI Delcy Studios, as we continue Hush Tober. Hushlings, I'm Declassified Dave. I'm Slick Frank Sanders. And I'm Mystery Mike. Come take a stroll with us as we walk the dusty roads of Utah and hop the fence into Skinwalker Ranch. It has been recognized as one of the most scientifically studied paranormal hotspots on the planet. We'll be breaking down all the bizarre phenomena of the property, including UFO sightings, cattle mutilations, and the Skinwalkers themselves. Join the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour for debriefing 34 Skinwalker Ranch, streaming Monday, October 18th. Welcome back 
to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. Like you said before, this is kind of bananas. You mentioned Dorothy Good. She was the daughter of William Good and Sarah Good. They were good. Oh, good. <laughs> good yeah. people. Shockingly enough, she was only four years old, like Mike said, and she was interrogated by local magistrates. Can you imagine some guy in a fluffy white hat being like, where were you on? And she's like, ah, uh, like all she wants is a Snickers bar. Pumpkin. It's ridiculous. She was interrogated and she confessed to being a witch. Apparently she was mad illiterate at four years old and purportedly claimed that she had seen her mother consorting with the devil. I doubt that. They just wanted to kill a four year old. Did the four year, did she get killed? Was she no. one of the people? I don't believe so. I don't believe that so. That was a Clinton family lead? <laughs> Mary Walcott and Ann Putnam Jr. I didn't know that females could be juniors. <laughs> Back huh. in the day. I guess so. Claimed the child was deranged and repeatedly bit them as if she were an animal. Kids well, do that. Old. She's yeah, four. Yeah, kids <laughs> four. <laughs> Heathen, you beast. <laughs> Dorothy was arrested, received a brief hearing in which the accusers repeatedly complained of bites on their arms. So she's in cuffs in the courtroom looking at a noose. Tough. And you've got people accusing her of being a heathen by biting on the arms. She's four. They sent the four-year-old to jail. <laughs> and at age five, she became the youngest person to be jailed during the Salem witch trials. Two days later, she was visited by Salem officials. Dorothy claimed she owned a snake given to her by her mother that talked to her and sucked blood from her finger. They took this to mean it was her familiar or supernatural entities that would assist witches and cunning folk in their practice of magic. Dorothy was in custody from March 24th, 1692, when she was arrested until she was released on bond for 50 pounds on December 10th of 1962. 1692. <laughs> 1962. Mad old now. <laughs> yeah, dummy old. In prison from when she was four to when she was 208. She's like Rose from Titanic. <laughs> it's been 84 years. <laughs> I used to be the youngest prisoner here. <laughs> Impersonations are getting better. She was never indicted or tried. Most of these people were thrown in unmarked graves. Ah, that sucks. Quick question before we move on. Yes. So we just talked about familiars, and familiars to witches are kind of like uh, like they're helpers, but they're in animal form, I guess. So I need to ask you guys, what would be your familiar? So if I was like a warlock. If you were a wicked warlock. And I have my own animal helper. Yeah, and I've seen you in a cape. It looks great. When? When you were warlocking. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, nobody's supposed to know about that, but I'd want like a dopey orangutan. Yeah. Nice. I like that. It's an orangutan that when he's bringing you cups of coffee, it's just spilling everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Dave? Oh, man. It's tough. It is tough. Does it have to be a functional animal that's going to help you? I'm going to get a guinea pig. It doesn't have to be functional in the form of, like, bringing you things or having opposable thumbs. Just something that would lure people away or whatever it would be to assist you in being a magic maker. I changed my answer. I want a horseshoe crab. <laughs> okay. A dire wolf. Oh, see? That's what I'm saying. You got to go with, like, something beastly. Yeah, something that just you tears know? something to shreds. Get off my land. Dire wolf for, for fucking sure. Is that your uh, answer, Mike? No, direwolf. no. You know, it's not going to be a dire wolf. It's going to be a brown bear. Because oh, then I could put a top hat on him, and he would look very dapper. Hell yeah. Yeah, brown bear. I see that. Brown Fresh. bear in a tuxedo. Would you put a saddle on it, though? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You'd have to. If you had some sort of familiar animal that was rideable, and you were not riding it, you are not utilizing that animal correctly. Heresy. It's just like if you had that orangutan, you know, you'd throw like a like one of those kids' backpacks on it and jump inside the backpack and like <laughs> yeah, around yeah. on its back. Well, let's get into a little science because it wouldn't be a Hush Hush Society debriefing without the science talk. Ba -ba -ba. Put on your lab coats. A study published in Science Magazine in 1976 cited the fungus ergot which is found in rye, wheat, and other cereals, which toxicologists say can cause 
symptoms such as delusions, vomiting, and muscle spasms. If you remember us talking about the MK Ultra episode, some town in France, Pont Saint Esprit. Hey, there you go. In the 1950s, yeah. Yeah, where they thought that there was a poisoning by the government of the water supply, but then they thought that it might be ergot poisoning within their wheat and barley and stuff. There's a callback. It's mm. also, I believe we mentioned in MK Ultra, it's an ingredient in LSD, one of the components. So the convulsions and weird shit. As we mentioned, this fungus grows on rye and related plants and produces alkaloids that can cause ergot poisoning in humans and other mammals who consume grains contaminated with its fruiting structure. So like you said, the, the Pont Saint-Esprit town, if you guys didn't hear our debriefing, it was like our second debriefing. Wow, well over a year ago. Hell yeah. And we talked about this small town in France that everyone started either getting sick, having seizures, and some people died. And it was very similar symptoms, but a lot of the accusations was that the U.S. government sprayed this town with LSD, and then another explanation could have been this ergot poisoning because a lot of people would have that. I actually just learned about a different form of rye in a certain part of Italy just because of a microclimate where the ergot poisoning doesn't happen. It's like one of the mm. only places. It's like a specific type of wheat, barley, and rye. The forbidden baguette. Don't eat the bread! As the Salem witch trials came to a conclusion, the respected minister Cotton Mather was warned of the dubious value of spectral evidence for testimony about dreams and visions. His concerns went largely unheeded during the Salem witch trials. Completely just going off of the evidence of somebody pointing a finger at somebody while they're having a fake seizure in a pew. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds legit. Good justice system, guys. Increase Mather, president of Harvard College and Cotton's father, later joined his son in urging that the standards of evidence for witchcraft must be equal to those of any other crime, concluding that, quote, it would be better that ten suspected witches may escape than one innocent person be condemned, end quote. See, these, that guy was logically thinking. That's Wholesome. a good man right there. Wholesome. Let's make sure they're witches before we burn them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Critical thinking at its pinnacle. Governor Phipps dissolved the court of Oyer and Terminer in October and mandated that its successor disregard spectral evidence. Trials continued with dwindling intensity until early 1693, and by that, Governor Phipps had pardoned and released all those in prison on witchcraft charges. In January 1697, the Massachusetts General Court declared a day of fasting for the tragedy of the Salem Witch Trials. The court later deemed the trials unlawful, and the leading justice Samuel Sewall publicly apologized for his role in the process. Fucking should. Just imagine having to be Samuel Sewall and apologizing for burning women. It gives me Fauci vibes. <laughs> oh, jeez. You gotta think, too, that early in the colony, within a hundred years or so of them being there, not even, I believe Proctor moved to the United States from London in 1650-something. So it wasn't that long before. And they're trying to make a name for themselves over in England because they had just left. They'd probably make it look like, oh, well, we got a big stick. We got mm -hmm. everything under control here. You guys don't need to come over here. And eventually, obviously, they did I think that was a big part of maybe some of the partly the whack thinking, old world thinking. And on top of that, this whole, well, we got to make sure that this situation is under control. It doesn't get out of whack. And a lot of it got pushed under the rug. If this was like a national thing, it would have happened in all the colonies. The damage to the community lingered. However, even after Massachusetts Colony passed legislation restoring the good names of the condemned and providing financial restitution to their heirs in 1711. Wow. Yeah, nice. They, well, money. I didn't know that there was a restitution paid to them. That's interesting. The vivid, brutal, and painful legacy of the Salem Witch Trials endured well into the 20th century, when Arthur Miller dramatized the events of 1692 in his play, The Crucible, written in 1953. At the 300th anniversary events in 1992, to commemorate the victims of the trials, a park was dedicated in Salem and a memorial in Danvers. It took until 1957 an act passed by the Massachusetts legislature absolved six people, with another one passing in 2001, absolving another five victims. 
Even as of 2004, there was still talk about exonerating all the victims. Yo, can you imagine being on the books still? Still as a witch, right? That's pretty crazy. Over 300 years later. <laughs> just, just even with, with today's science, with today's like, like knowing what was going on, with people just accusing one another and going crazy, you just still go, hmm, you know, some of these people, I know they weren't witches, but that one girl, I swear. Well, I bet you they're not in like the record system of the current justice system. I'm sure they're in like some type of hall of records, you know, that need to be accessed and you have to find them. I mean, it's 1600s. Gotta be a witch. In the hall of dusty witch books. <laughs> <laughs> in January 2016, the University of Virginia announced its Gallows Hill project team had determined the execution site in Salem where the 19 people accused of being witches had been hanged. There's major speculation that the hanging site was a lot closer to the town where more public can see. Also, Gallows Hill was too steep for cart-carrying prisoners. The city had since dedicated the Proctor's Ledge Memorial to the victims there in 2017. So the Proctor's Ledge Memorial, that they think is actually where the hangings happened. Mm because of records from, I believe, a direct descendant of Proctor. I will say, Hushlings, if you've never been to Salem, it's definitely a a trip down memory lane if you're a surviving witch. <laughs> a lot of information to take in. Let's get into our final thoughts about the Salem witch trials in this spooky Hushtober. David. In the spirit of our show, being a conspiracy podcast... <laughs> I want to try to find a conspiracy in this. I think at least there's some form or shape of this entire situation, at least on a local level, that was a cover-up. Obviously covered up a bunch of stuff. It would take a long time to go through the records. For me, I think it's just it's one of the most fucked up situations that's happened in this country. And the Inquisition itself is kind of psychotic to think about. Growing up so close to it, I guess, makes it a little bit more tied. You're, you're a little bit more interested in it then maybe you wouldn't if you weren't from an hour and a half away from Salem and it wasn't part of your every single year. Everybody either in high school, oh, we're going to Salem for the day or you doing a trip there or whatever. But all in all, uh, I don't think that these people were witches. I think the justice system and the powers that be were just real big assholes and believed in some real crazy shit. That's my final thought. Those little girls were little jerks and they actually apologized, I think, afterwards because they got attention by acting a fool and people died from it. It's a messed up situation. I also believe that these little girls were just making stuff up. They enjoyed the attention and they enjoyed taking out their enemies, which is really what I think this was all about. I think it was about getting rid of people that you didn't like or people that were in your way or whatever it may be. I think that's where a lot of these accusations came from. To say that none of them were witches, I think is an understatement. I don't think any of them were witches. Not to say that witches don't exist. A lot of these trials were based in paranoia. You have a group of people getting accused of doing magic or consorting with the devil or whatever it may be. And I think that's based in a lot of fear with things that were going on in the world. The Native Americans trying to kill you. You have disease going around. You have... Who else knows what, where everybody is pointing fingers at each other anyways. But that's my final thought. Frank, what are your final thoughts? Frank's final thought. Final thoughts on the Salem Witch Trials. I don't necessarily think that there is some big cover-up at play. I'm sure there's stuff to it that wasn't documented necessarily. I, I would have a different opinion if people in high positions of high authority in the community were being accused of being witches and being hanged, but that wasn't really the case. It was just local townsfolk and people of that sort, farmers, neighbors, siblings. And I'm sure a lot of it was just people accusing others that they weren't fond of or they disagreed with or they just didn't like in general and they were just trying to get rid of them, which is disgusting, but it happened nonetheless. I'm sure there was a handful of girls actually practicing witchcraft during this time that actually kickstarted it. I don't know, I've got a funky stance on witchcraft. I don't know if any of that stuff actually does anything, but they might have been out in the woods 
performing some sort of ritual or trying to do something. But I don't think that every person that was accused and executed were, were doing all of that. Now, I've got two quick stories on actual modern witch stuff, which kind of just like furthers my belief that this stuff to an extent is real. Again, I don't know how it actually affects like the real world, how, how these rituals actual outcomes are. I don't know if they actually do anything or not. Back in like 2015, I'd gotten out of school one day and I was all angry school home something. So I'm walking across town and I always took the train tracks everywhere. I was walking down the train tracks. I was probably three quarters of the way across town to one of my buddy's houses. This portion of the train tracks is parallel to a small river. So I'm walking down the tracks and on the river bank, I noticed a small little glimmer of a flame. So I, I got off the tracks and I walked down the embankment to like go check it out. And there was a white candle propped up against a tree and around the candle was, I can't say how many, but a thick circle of brand new pennies. So I'm looking at it and the candle was freshly lit. There wasn't like a lot of uh, melted wax. It was lit very recently till when I was around that area. So me being stupid and probably high, um, I did something I probably shouldn't have. I picked up a handful of the pennies and I threw them angrily into the river. I don't know what I was mad about, but I threw a handful of these pennies into the river and then I just walked away thinking nothing of it. And in the following days, I started to dwell on it, like maybe I shouldn't have done that, maybe that was some sort of witch stuff. There was a witchcraft store in the town that I'd grown up in where this happened, so there was definitely people practicing that sort of thing in the area. And I dwelled on it for years, up until recently I was just telling a coworker about that very experience. And I thought maybe it had, like, given me bad luck or something. And I actually looked it up. It's it's something that somebody can perform to, like, bring more wealth and money into their life. So that kind of dissolved the idea that, okay, maybe I didn't gain some bad luck juju from doing that. And then a couple years later, this was probably 2019, I was on the same train tracks I was going to fish. And that same river where I was on the embankment of later down the tracks dumps out into a little lake so i'm walking down the tracks and you got to go down onto a path to get to the lake it's kind of deep in the woods and on the path i stumbled across a piece of paper that was folded in the middle of the path and all on top of the paper were flower petals and different sorts of fresh herbs and spices and things of that sort and i was with one of my friends and at that point i'm just like looking at it remembering the candle thing. I chose not to touch it, but before I could say anything, my friend picked up the letter and actually opened it up and he tried reading it. It was in some like crazy hard to read cursive, something about it being some sort of offering and he uh, folded back up the letter and left it where it was. So I've come across actual witch sort stuff, so I do not doubt for a second that there were people back then practicing this sort of thing and that it continues today. Not that they weren't people doing it, because obviously their people were, but I think it just spun out of control. And I think it really had to do with that Samuel Paris was kind of the mastermind. I mean, he was the minister of the church, so he was kind of the mastermind of the whole spiral because his kid was there doing it. But the wildest thing is that Proctor was accused by Paris's daughter or niece or something. It's very strange. And there must have been very small, tight-knit communities for it to just spread like that. I just keep playing it over and over of what it would be like today if something like that happened in like a small town. Yeah. Dangerous situation. Just to add one more thought to that, it makes me kind of wonder if Samuel Paris was some sort of warlock. Mm, or he was the devil himself. So he comes into this town, he kind of, you know, says there's witches here, accuses people of being a witch... Then goes and finds a bunch of, quote, innocents, puts them to death, sets them on fire, maybe gives a couple offerings to the devil. Fucking warlock, man. We're making warlock t-shirts. It's coming. Well, Hushlings, that's going to do it for debriefing 33 on the Salem Witch Trials. Spooky stuff. What were your thoughts? Did we miss anything? Was there any topics we should have discussed? Any points that we should have made? Did we forget the worm's wart? The frog's breath? The eye of newt? 
you can hit us up at contact at hushhushsociety.com. Be sure to join us for Debriefing 34, Monday, October 18th, where we're going to get into Skinwalker Ranch. We are going to dig up all the strange, weird stuff going on over there. And remember, Hushlings, our Patreon is going to be live on November 1st. We hate to drill it into you, but we also know that you will absolutely enjoy it. So stay tuned for the rest of the details, and we will tell you more on November 1st. Thank you again, Hushlings, for joining the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And I'm Suck Frank Sanders. Which shame, 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 shame. Until our next debriefing, remember, the best kept secrets are hidden in plain sight.